Well, good morning, everyone. We're glad that you guys are back with us today, whether you're in the room or watching online. We are starting a new study in the book of 1 Thessalonians that we just kicked off last week. And for the next few weeks, we're actually going to be in a series called Faith That Works in a World That Doesn't. Now, last month, we spent a lot of time talking about how a person's faith grows. But this month, we're spending all of our time talking about what faith actually looks like. And it's really, really important for our faith because I really do believe that there are a lot of misunderstandings that people have about what faith actually looks like. And if those misunderstandings aren't addressed, then what ends up happening is people end up saying to themselves, faith doesn't work. But what I'm arguing in this series is that faith does work. But sometimes we practice a version of faith that doesn't work. And so think about it like this. Maybe it's a great example. Maybe it's a terrible example. You can decide. Anybody ever had a bad haircut? Yes, of course you have. Some of you are rocking a bad haircut right now. I'm not pointing fingers or anything like that. But we've all had a bad haircut at some point in our lives. Did you stop getting your haircut? No, you did not. Because you knew that was something that you still needed in your life. So what you did is you said, I'm not going to go to that particular stylist or that particular barber anymore, I'm, but I'm not going to stop getting my hair cut. See, I believe that there are a lot of people who have had problems with faith, but instead of looking at their faith very, very carefully, they walked away from faith altogether. And that was a tragic mistake in their lives. See, what we're trying to do in this series is we're taking our faith and we're putting it under a microscope and we're saying, we're going to look long and hard at what faith actually looks like. And we're going to see whether or not we have the kind of faith that Jesus actually gave us while he was on the earth with us. And if we don't have the kind of faith that he gave us, then we're going to make some changes, some adjustments so that we can get the right kind of faith rather than walking away from faith altogether. And see, this right here is why the book of First Thessalonians is so important. The apostle Paul traveled into this town. He shared with them the message of Jesus Christ. He planted a Christian church and then he had to leave that town. And when he left that town, he left, but he was still very concerned about the Christians who were in that town. And so he sent one of his teammates, a guy named Timothy, said, Timothy, I want you to go in there and I want you to check on them and I want you to come back and let me know how things are going for them. And so Timothy went, he came back to the apostle Paul and he said, Paul, I got bad news and I got good news. He said, what's the bad news? He said, the bad news is life for these Christians is really, really hard. He said, what's the good news? He said, the good news is that their faith is really, really strong. And so the Apostle Paul writes them a letter based on that report. And in the letter, he actually says this, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7, he said, you guys became a model to all of the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. What he's saying to them in essence is that I wish that everyone in your part of the world had the kind of faith that you guys have because your faith is actually making a difference in your life. And as the Apostle Paul brags on them for the kind of faith that they have, at the same time, he is highlighting for us the kind of faith that we need to have if we really want a faith that will actually make a difference in our lives. Now, I'm guessing that some of you have actually met some people in your life who have that kind of faith. That, that you look at them and you go, man, I, I don't know what it is about them, but they've got a faith that works and they've got a faith that's real. They've got a faith that works when everything is going their way and they've got the kind of faith that works when nothing is going their way. And you look at them and you admire them. And that's why we're developing this kind of series. Because what I want in this series is I want God to grow in you and develop in you a kind of faith that works when everything in life is going your way. But I also want you to have the kind of faith that works when nothing in life is going your way. So last week we started the study. We looked at one verse last week. It was 1 Thessalonians Chapter 1, verse 3, we looked at several aspects of their faith. This is the kind of faith they had. It's the kind of faith we need to have. 
This week we're moving on to verses four and five. We're covering two verses. So we're like really making ground this week. You're going to love it. First Thessalonians chapter one, verses four and five. Paul wrote this. He said, for we know brothers and sisters loved by God that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. And so as Paul gets started, he acknowledges the fact that they have a really strong relationship with God. In fact, he says, it's obvious to me that as I look at you, as I hear about your faith, it's obvious that you are loved by God and that you have been chosen by God. That language loved and chosen actually comes right out of the Old Testament. Okay. When God started a relationship with humanity, he started a relationship with a nation called Israel. And he said to Israel, you can read about it. Deuteronomy chapter seven, verses seven and eight. He says, I have chosen you because I love you. And that's how their relationship got started. And now the apostle Paul is writing to these people who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul says, it is obvious to me that God loves you and that God has chosen you. You, he's saying, I can look at your life and I can see that your faith is real, that you've got a faith that's making a real difference in your life. And he says that the gospel came to them, not simply with words, but also with power. Now, I'm going to talk about that word power here in just a minute. But before I talk about that word, I need to talk about the word gospel. Because the gospel, that word is a very churchy word. Word And there are a lot of people who do not understand what that word means. And yet I really do believe it's one of the most important words in all of Scripture. And so that word gospel, you need to know, um, it, it wasn't even really a religious word. It was a political word. Now, the word literally means good news. Okay, so that's what gospel means. But it was used in a political context. And so think about the first century with me for just a second. Okay. First century, I'm going to tell you something that should be fairly obvious. They didn't have the internet. Okay. And so in their day and in their time, when someone wanted to share good news, they didn't have ABC, CBS, NBC, CNBC, Fox News, Newsmax, whoever you're into, they didn't have it. Okay. And so what happened in the first century is if someone wanted to share the news or the good news, they would send a messenger. And the messenger would travel into a new part of the world. They would gather large crowds of people and say, the emperor or the empire has sent me to declare the gospel to you, to declare good news to you. They would draw a crowd and then they would share a type of gospel message or a good news story with the people who had gathered. In fact, in their day, a gospel declaration often sounded something like this. Remember, political context. They might say, Caesar Augustus has won every battle and has ended the war. He has defeated the enemy and brought peace to the empire. He has set into motion a new era in human history. Because of him, You can now enjoy Pax Romana or the peace of Rome. Give him your allegiance. Caesar is Lord. And that was a really common type of gospel story or good news story that was shared among the people of Jesus' time. And then Jesus comes along and Jesus in an attempt to make things clear to people, he uses the exact same kind of language. Jesus says, you think that was good news. I've got really good news for you. And so he sends his messengers out into the world with another type of gospel. It sounds similar in some ways, but it's different in other ways. So his gospel would have read more like this. Jesus Christ has fought every battle and he has won the war. He has defeated the enemies of sin and death and has brought peace to his people. 
He has set into motion a new era in human history. And because of him, you can now enjoy peace with God and peace with one another. Give him your allegiance. Jesus is Lord. And that is the kind of gospel that the Apostle Paul is talking about. A gospel that actually came to the people. A a good news story about the fact that God has ushered into humanity a new era of human history where Jesus Christ has done a work on the cross to establish for us peace with God and peace with one another. And because of the work that he has done, we should give him our allegiance because not Caesar Augustus is Lord, but no, Jesus Christ is Lord. And the people in Thessalonica, they heard that gospel message and they put their faith in it. They put their faith in Jesus Christ and their faith actually made a difference in their life. Paul says the gospel didn't just come to you in words, but it came to you in power. And again, you know people who have this kind of faith, that you look at them and you look at what they're going through and you think to yourself, man, I don't know how those people have the strength or the power to get through what they're going through. I don't understand how they have the power to deal with all that they're dealing with. What do they know that I don't know? What do they have that I don't have. They have a kind of faith that makes a real difference in their life. And as Paul talks about their faith in verses four and five, he highlights a few more aspects of their faith. It's not just the faith that they had, it's the kind of faith that we need to have. He talks about the power, he talks about the Holy Spirit, and he also talks about deep conviction. So let me start by talking about power. He said the gospel did not just come to you in words, but in power. Now, there are a lot of people who evaluate the effectiveness of faith based on the issue of power. Okay, So if I see God's power at work, then I conclude faith is real. But if I don't see God's power at work, then I conclude that faith doesn't really work or that God isn't really real, right? In fact, I might say it like this. A lot of people will ask God to do things for them. And if God does them, then yes, faith works. But if God doesn't do what I ask him to do, then they conclude that faith doesn't work. I'll give you an example. This last week, I saw someone who is a a strong critic of Christianity. They made this post. We'll throw it up on the side screen. It's a picture of the Pope. And basically what they say in the post is that prayer is powerless. It doesn't work. And their logic is pretty simple. The Pope prays for world peace And world peace is not happening. And so the logic goes that if the Pope is praying for world peace and peace isn't happening, then the problem is not with the person or with the Pope. The problem is with prayer. Prayer doesn't work. Faith doesn't work. God doesn't listen to you. God doesn't care. God isn't real. Walk away from your faith. You're wasting your time. Right? In fact, a lot of us have probably had a similar thought in our own minds. We've prayed for things, and God didn't answer our prayers the way we wanted. And we started to wonder whether or not God really cared. We started to wonder if prayers are really being heard. We started questioning whether or not faith even works. And yet I would just say that the problem with that approach is that you are trying to hold God accountable for doing something that he never promised to do in the first place. And so go back to the Pope's example, right? There's the Pope. The Pope is praying for world peace. Let me tell you something. God never promised world peace. You can ask for it, but God didn't promise it. 
And yet a lot of us go through life going, well, I'm asking God to do something and God isn't doing it. So faith doesn't really work. God never promised peace because God understands that there is a real spiritual enemy that is at work in this world that you do not see, but he sees. God sees the spiritual enemy who is at work, and that spiritual enemy has a deep-seated hatred for God and for all of God's people, and he is at war, not at peace. He is at war with God and his people, and God knows it, so God has not promised world peace until this world is over, and that enemy has been defeated once and for all. Now, has God promised us peace? Yes, God said, I promise to give you a kind of peace that will help you through trials and hardships. But God has not promised world peace anywhere in this book, the Bible, right? Go into the Old Testament. Do you see anything in the Old Testament that looks like or resembles world peace? No, it is a bloodbath in the Old Testament. No world peace in that part of the book, right? How about in the New Testament? Think about the book of Revelation, a book that tells us about the future of life on this earth. Do you see any sense of world peace? Absolutely not. It is violent. It is bloody. It is not going to be fun at the end of this world, okay? No sense of world peace. How about in the Gospels? How about from Jesus? Anything in there about world peace? No, nothing. In fact, Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. He said, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. That's who Jesus is. Jesus has not promised to give us world peace. And so what we cannot do is we cannot evaluate or determine that faith doesn't work because God's not doing something that he never promised to do in the first place. And so when it comes to power, we need to be really, really clear. The question is not, how do you want God to use his power in your life? The question is, how does God want to use his power in your life? And when you read about God's power throughout the New Testament, you will see over and over again that God is using his power in your life to bring you to faith in Jesus and then to make you more like Jesus. And so think about some of the passages with me, the passages that say his power is used to bring us to Jesus. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 to 18 the Apostle Paul, who also wrote 1 Thessalonians, he wrote this. He said, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with, there's our word, power through your Holy Spirit in your inner being so that, why are you giving me power? So that Christ may dwell or live in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have, there's the word again, you may have power together with all the Lord's holy people. I want all of you to have power. Power to do what? To grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And so the power of God is at work in our lives to bring us to faith in Jesus so that we will understand in our minds the incredible love of Jesus, so that we can then live in relationship with Jesus all the days of our lives. This is how God's power is at work in our lives. It's what his power is really about. Listen to me. His power is not about world peace. His power is not at work in this world to score you a parking spot. His power is not at work in the world so that you can score a job promotion. It's not at work in the world so that you can nail that prom date and be like, yes, I got the girl of my dreams to go to the prom with me. And yet that's the way a lot of people think, that God's power is out there to do what I want him to do rather than doing the things that he has actually promised to do. And he just wants you to know his power is at work to bring you to Jesus and to make you more like Jesus. Romans 15, 13, Paul wrote again. He said, may the God of hope 
fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit that is at work in us. So what's he want to do? He wants to bring us to Jesus and then he wants to make us like Jesus. He wants to use his power in our lives so that you can experience the kind of joy in your life that Jesus had in his life. He wants you to have the kind of peace in your spirit that Jesus had in his spirit while he was on the earth. He wants you to have a kind of hope that Jesus had when he was on the earth. And so again, the question is not, what do we want God to use his power to do in our lives? The question is, what does he want to use his power to do in our lives? And it's pretty clear when you read the scriptures that God uses his power to bring us to Jesus and to make us more like Jesus. And the reason that it requires his power is because the Christian life is very much a supernatural life. If you will really read the teachings of Jesus and see what he calls you to, you will read it and you will go, there is absolutely no way that I could live my life like that. And you would be right, unless he gives you the power to do it. Come back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. He said about these people in Thessalonica, he said, The gospel, the good news, came to you not simply in words, but in power. And so when Jesus calls you to follow him by faith, the kind of faith that will actually make a difference in your life, he's not just telling you what to do. He is also giving you the power to do it. He's giving you the power to deal with the sin in your life that you've been struggling with for as long as you can remember. He wants to give you the power to chase down the dreams that God has put in your heart. He wants to give you the power to keep commitments that you don't feel like keeping, maybe commitments in your marriage. He wants you to have the power to make difficult decisions that need to be made in your life. He doesn't just tell you what to do. It's a kind of faith in a God who also gives you the power to do what he has asked you to do. And that power comes through the Holy Spirit. It's a kind of faith that actually works in a world that doesn't. And so again, just to be really clear, we have to think about power and we have to ask, what does he want to use his power to do in my life? Not what do I want him to use his power to do in my life now? I need you to know something about this power of God, okay? This is not some kind of mysterious power. This is a power that actually comes from the Holy Spirit of God, the third member of the Trinity. Now, one of the reasons that your faith may not make much of a difference in your life is because you are uncomfortable with the Holy Spirit. And I think that's an issue for a lot of people. Most of us, when we think about God, we are pretty comfortable with God the Father, right? We have an earthly father and we think about that and we go, okay, I need a heavenly father. I need a a better version of that guy in my life. And so we're comfortable with the heavenly father. And then we think about Jesus and we're pretty comfortable with Jesus because let's just be honest, no member of the Trinity gets airtime like Jesus does in Christian circles. So we spend a lot of time thinking about talking about Jesus, thinking about that member of the Trinity of God who like literally lived and walked among us as a man so that we can understand who God is and what God's like and what God expects out of us. And so we're comfortable with the Father and the Son, but a lot of us are really uncomfortable with the Holy Spirit. And some of you are uncomfortable with the Holy Spirit because you have a scientific bent to you. And so when you think about the Holy Spirit, that sounds very supernatural. And you live in the natural world. You think scientific, not supernatural. And so when you start talking about the supernatural aspect of who God is, And what God wants to do in my life through this power, you kind of run in the other direction back toward what is natural. You think about Jesus, you go back to the Father, but you're not sure you want anything to do with the Holy Spirit. 
And I get that because I'm a logical person. So I can understand how that's a struggle for you. Others of us, and this is a big one for me, I struggle with the Holy Spirit and being comfortable with the Holy Spirit because I've seen some churches who are, quote unquote, all about the Holy Spirit. And I've seen these churches do some things that I don't understand. I see things going on in these churches that are, quote unquote, all about the Holy Spirit. And they're experiencing things and doing things that I've never experienced and that I've never done. I look at some of those things and some of those things, like I don't even know how to make sense of the value of that. Like when you see someone put their hands on someone's head and they get knocked out and they fall out on the floor, like that seems dangerous, not helpful. Like I, I look at that and I go, okay, like, like what's that about? And because I don't understand it, because I haven't experienced it, sometimes I allow other churches that, here's the most important word of what I'm saying, that may be, may be misrepresenting the Holy Spirit. And I allow those churches to affect the way that I think about the Holy Spirit. And then I run away from the Holy Spirit because that seems uncomfortable. That seems strange. That's something that I don't understand. And then as a result, what happens is I've got a big hole in my faith because I've missed a component of my faith, the Holy Spirit of God that produces power, that is my counselor. And I don't have the Holy Spirit at work in my life because I'm running away from the Holy Spirit. And then I start to feel like faith doesn't work. And I wonder why? It's because the Holy Spirit is absolutely a critical component of the Christian faith. You cannot come to Jesus without the Holy Spirit working in your life. You cannot become like Jesus without the Holy Spirit working in your life. And so I want you to think about what Jesus actually said about the Holy Spirit of God. Don't, don't let other churches speak for God. Let God speak for himself, okay? And so I was thinking about this, and I wanted to take you to a passage in John chapter 14, around verse 16, okay? Uh, Francis Chan wrote a book called Forgotten God, where he talks all about the Holy Spirit. And he actually goes and he really picks apart what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit in John 14, 16. Listen to this quote. It says that Jesus said that the Father would give the disciples, quote, another counselor to be with them forever. John 14, 16, NIV. In this case, that Greek word that Jesus uses, another, means another that is just like the first, as opposed to Another that is of a different sort or kind than the first. So Jesus was saying that the one who would come, the spirit who would come, would be just like him. And then he asked this question. Have you ever thought about the significance of having another counselor who is just like Christ? And when I hear that, I think, why in the world would I not want the Holy Spirit in my life? With all the stress that I'm carrying in my life, with all the struggles that I have, with all the relationships that I'm trying to navigate, with all the decisions that I have to make, why on earth would I not want a counselor in my life who is just like Jesus? And yet there are a lot of us who are afraid of the Holy Spirit because we misunderstand the Holy Spirit when we should be instead asking for the Holy Spirit, even leaning into the Holy Spirit, right? What did Jesus say in Luke chapter 11, verse 13? He said, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Jesus seems to be saying that we have no business being afraid or feeling uncomfortable with the Holy Spirit. Instead, we should be saying, come on, God, give me more of the Holy Spirit in my life. I want the Spirit to counsel me so that I can know what to do. And I want the Spirit to give me power so that I have the power to now do what I know to do. And yet there are a lot of us that are so wigged out by the Holy Spirit. That as a result, we're walking around with a big hole in our faith and it leads us to believe that faith doesn't really work. We need 
the Holy Spirit. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the counsel of the Holy Spirit. But then Paul also helps us understand that we need deep conviction. And that deep conviction, it comes from the Holy Spirit. If you see a person who has a faith that is making a real difference in their life, it is probably because that person has really deep biblical convictions in their life. But if you see a person who has a faith that isn't making much of a difference in their life, those people probably do not have deep convictions that are rooted in what the Bible says or are rooted in what Jesus has said. You may have moral values. You may have some kind of faith. Maybe it's a more of a casual faith, but it's probably not the kind of faith that is producing in you really deep convictions over what Jesus has said. And here's the problem with that. People without deep convictions, they are easily influenced. And so I could probably talk you into something this morning. But if you don't have deep convictions for yourself, someone else will talk you out of it tomorrow morning when you go to work. I, I can talk you into something on Sunday. But someone else will talk you into something on Friday or Saturday. Because you don't have deep convictions that keep you rooted and grounded in following after Jesus Christ. So one who doesn't have any convictions, one who doesn't have deep convictions, they're more like a jellyfish that is just kind of floating through the ocean. Whatever current grabs you next, it pushes you in a completely new direction in life that you weren't even planning on going down. So here's how it plays out. You end up developing some new friendships and meeting some new people. And all of a sudden, because you don't have deep convictions that keep you rooted and grounded in following Jesus, they have ideas and they feel really strong about their ideas. And so you like this jellyfish, you just kind of get swept up in this new current and you get grabbed and your life starts going in a completely new direction that you didn't plan on going because of the new people that you're around, the convictions that they have and the lack of convictions that you had. Or you go off to college, this happens all the time. And you get to college and you don't have deep convictions for yourself. You went to a church and the guy on the stage had deep convictions. Your mama and your daddy had deep convictions. Your grandparents had deep convictions. You just didn't have deep convictions. Because there were a lot of parents who raised their kids saying, I'm going to let them figure it out for themselves. Terrible mistake, mom and dad. You, you give them deep convictions. And you help them get grounded so that before they go off to college, they're not like that jellyfish that just gets swept in a new current into a new way of thinking and takes their life in a direction that they never intended to go. And yet this happens all the time in our world. We find ourselves just getting swept away by these new currents, drifting in new and dangerous directions. And so if you're here and you go, okay, like what's it look like to have a, a deep biblical conviction? I'm just going to give you one. And if you can just hold on to this one and kind of build your entire faith around this one deep biblical conviction, I promise you this, you will become a very grounded person who isn't swept away by the different currents and trends of the world around you. And here's the conviction that I want to give you. Jesus was not wrong about anything. Okay. That's a deep conviction. It's just to come to a place in your life where your faith is built around this idea that Jesus Christ really is who he said he is and he really will do what he has promised to do both in the present and certainly in the future. And if you can just get rooted in this idea that Jesus was not wrong about anything, if that's the only deep conviction that you have, I really do believe that it will be enough for you. It will create in you a kind kind of faith that actually works in a world that doesn't. John Ortberg once said it like this. He said, faith is coming to believe with my whole body what I say I believe in my mind. That is a deep conviction. I, I know you think in your mind that Jesus is who he said he is and that he will do what he has promised to do. 
Now that has to make its way from your mind throughout your entire body because that has implications for how you live, for how you work, for how you engage in relationships, for how you spend money, for how you relate in every area of your life. It becomes a faith that actually makes a difference in your life. If you live in this world long enough, this world will change you and not for good if you don't have deep biblical convictions. But if you do have that deep biblical conviction, the world will not change you, but you will change the world. And so I want to ask you today to to be honest with yourself. Do you have deep convictions? Maybe just as important as that question is, do your kids have deep convictions? Do you believe that Jesus was not wrong? Do your kids believe Jesus was not wrong? That he really is who he said he is, son of God. That he really will do what he has promised to do. If he said, I promise you this, I'm coming out of that grave in three days, and he did it, everything else that he said about what he'll do in the future, you can take it to the bank. And so do you believe those things? Do your kids believe those things. As we wrap up our service today, I'm going to ask the band to come on out and they're going to close us with a really powerful song. This whole service has been designed to try to help you understand that the Holy Spirit is an absolutely key component to the Christian faith. And so the song that they're going to lead us in is a song called Holy Spirit. And it makes a point that I probably haven't been able to make in my message that the Holy Spirit is absolutely critical. It is powerful. It does so much for you, not just in your life, but in your faith. And so while they play and while they lead us in this song, I want to give an opportunity for some of you. Right through these double doors over to my right, my friend David is going to open up those doors. And if you're looking at your faith today and you're going, my faith is lacking. It is really incomplete. I've been running away from the Holy Spirit and I need to be leaning into the Holy Spirit. If you're looking at your life and you're going, I don't even have faith, then I want you to know there's pastors, there's some ladies also who are going to be in that room and we're going to be available to you to talk to you about a faith that is incomplete as well as a faith that may be non-existent. And if we can pray for you or help you in any way, then we're going to be available. We're going to be in that room Um, because quite honestly, I'm half deaf. I'm 42. I sat on the front row at Mosaic for far too long and now I don't hear very well. And so for me to stand up here at the front, like a lot of churches would naturally do, it would not be a very helpful conversation. So I just want a quiet place and I want a safe place for you to come and speak with a pastor or speak with someone else about the faith in your life, about struggles that you're having in faith, about the incomplete faith, or about the non-existent faith that God may be working on you about today. And so if we can help you in any way, I want you to come to that room. For the rest of you, I want you to stand, I want you to sing, and I want you to celebrate the Holy Spirit of God and what the Holy Spirit came to do for us. Let me pray as you stand. God, we just thank you um, for this word and uh, for this reminder of what Christian faith actually looks like. And so, God, I want your Holy Spirit to just be unleashed in this room right now. I want more of your Holy Spirit. I want your Holy Spirit to come and to move. I want your Holy Spirit to give power and counsel. I want your Holy Spirit to to develop in us deep convictions, God. I want the Holy Spirit to bring people right now to Jesus and to make others more like Jesus. And so, God, I just ask that the Holy Spirit move and that people feel the freedom to move however your spirit leads them. And I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.